everyone, welcome to a special edition of ML News. We have something to discuss. OpenAI just released an embeddings endpoint to their API. This is accompanied by a blog post called Introducing Text and Code Embeddings in the OpenAI API. Now, after the, let's call them big successes of GPT-3 and Codex, which is the model that powers GitHub's Copilot, OpenAI pushes forward into the domain of embeddings. Hold on, this video is sponsored by Weights and Biases. Weights and Biases is your one-stop shop for all your machine learning needs. It will track your experiments with a single line of code. It'll upload automatically all your logs, all your configurations, everything to your cloud. It will automatically grab all the output, all the metrics, all the configurations of your experiments and store that in one neat location. So you can see your experiments, you can track them wherever they run. You can compare among the experiments but you can go further. You can then tune your hyperparameters according to the results of those experiments. And all of this is done automatically in a distributed way. You can literally sit on your toilet on your smartphone and tune your hyperparameters and start new experiments. But it's not only experiment tracking and hyperparameter tuning. Weights and Biases has tools for the entire pipeline of machine learning research from the initial idea up until the deployment and beyond that when you actually want to track what you've deployed. Weights and Biases has cool methods to track all of your data set and their dependencies to each other, as well as your models and all kinds of other artifacts that you might produce. They're very powerful visualizations for all the inputs and outputs of your pipelines, as well as the models themselves. All of this runs in the cloud, but if you're concerned about privacy, there are options to self-host. The system is free for personal use and for academics, and they have great plans for enterprises, small teams, large teams, doesn't matter. So thank you very much Weights and Biases for sponsoring this video. If you don't know them yet, absolutely check them out. It's free, it'll make your life a whole lot easier. Now let's get into the video. So briefly said, an embedding model associates a piece of text with a fixed sized vector. The fixed sized vector can then be used to do semantic similarity search in high dimensional spaces, among other things. They have a toy depiction of these uh, embeddings right here. Now, as this clearly shows, furries and football fans are in fact linearly separable. So, you know. Thanks, OpenAI. In order to get these embeddings, you'd interact with the OpenAI API as you would else. You'd instantiate it, you call it, you get back a vector. They have three different modes available. One is for text similarity, which essentially means that you can put in pieces of text and if the vectors are close together, that means the text are in some way similar. The second one is for text search, where they have a separate encoder for documents, which are, I guess, longer pieces of content, and queries, which are shorter pieces of content. And the idea is that you would rank document vectors against a query vector, and then whichever ones fall closest together, those would be the relevant documents to retrieve for that query. It's a bit similar to text similarity. Uh, the differences are in the length of the things that you put into the models, and also a little bit of the semantics, although I don't think there's too much of a difference. The last one is code search, which is essentially the same as text search for code. What's also to be said is that these come in different sizes, uh, Ada being the smallest and Da Vinci being the largest. Da Vinci is the original 175 billion parameter GPT-3 model size. They do release a paper along with it on how they train this thing and what the results are. And the brief summary is that in various data sets and various tasks, they do beat previous state-of-the-art results. For example, in linear probe classification, which is where you take embeddings and then you train just a small linear layer on top with a labeled data set. They outperform previous state of the art. They also do so in text search task in the buyer retrieval benchmark. And lastly, they outperform on code search quite a bit. The paper goes into more details on how the model was trained. They explain that it is a contrastive loss that they've used. Essentially, what you want to do is you want to encode pieces of text through the encoder and then make similar things closer to each other and negatives, uh, in this case, in batch negatives further apart from each other. This does require quite large batch sizes to actually get an accurate distribution of negatives. But you know, it's uh, open AI, so they can do it. 
As I said, their models go from 300 million parameters for the smallest to 175 billion for the largest, with the embedding dimensions going from 1024 up to a ridiculous 12,288. Now, you might think the larger dimension is a good thing, but this is not necessarily the case right here. This is one of the criticisms that's going to come up in a short while. You can also see right here that, yeah, indeed, the batch size is pretty large. The paper itself goes into a little bit more detail into the results. And here we kind of see the first scratches in uh, what people are now saying about this model, namely that it doesn't seem to perform that well. Now, while these average results that they have presented, uh, mostly from their extra large models, do outperform other things, is very often that they don't outperform them by that much. And if you actually look in selected tasks, then it's not even clear they're the best model. Also, they seem to compare sometimes to quite outdated baselines. As you can see, these papers are sometimes from 2021. And uh, last I checked, it's 2022. So, you know, OpenAI. Get your crap in order. Now, by far the biggest controversial point right here is the price. As they say in their documentation, encoding 1000 tokens with a DaVinci model will cost you 60 cents. Now, 60 cents doesn't sound like a lot, but corpora often have a lot more than 1000 tokens. Remember that tokens are not even words, they're kind of sub words. And that means that this model is quite expensive. Now this gets drastically cheaper if you go down to the smaller models, as you can see the Curie embeddings are already 10 times smaller and Babbage and Ada another factor of eight or so. So pretty shortly, uh, this Twitter thread here blew up by Niels Reimers, who says GPT-3 embeddings by OpenAI was announced this week. I was excited and tested them on 20 data sets. Sadly, they are worse than open models that are 1000 times smaller and running OpenAI models can be at 1 million times more expensive. This is accompanied by a medium post called OpenAI GPT-3 text embeddings, really a new state of the art in dense text embeddings, where he leverages a lot of these points that I've said previously. Like, like, they seem to not compare to the most recent and most performing baselines. And their results don't seem to be that far ahead of the competition, especially if you consider the smaller models. And also that they did weird selections of data sets that they've trained on. For example, the Bayer benchmark has 18 data sets and they have chosen to just test on 11 of them and report average performance across those 11. So Niels assembled his own benchmark of tasks and tested these models against some openly available models. And the most shocking conclusion is that it seems to be that for some tasks at least, you can get much better performance with the open models at astonishingly low cost. As you can see in this table here, this lists performance against the cost of encoding 1 million documents, which even for the smallest open AI model costs $800, goes up to $60,000 for the largest one. And on the open models, well, the most expensive tested right here will cost you $6.80 and the best performing one $2.40. Now it is to be said that these prices are probably made such that the largest possible shock effect is achieved. Very often when he mentions prices, he says that, well, this is the cost of like a preemptible T4 GPU, which I guess, first of all, you get the difficulty of being preemptible, which you don't get with OpenAI. And second of all, good luck finding quota for a T4 anywhere on the planet right now. But point taken, uh, the open models can be significantly cheaper and the blog post explores the results from the paper itself also a bit more. Again, pointing out that the advantages aren't that much, sometimes something like 0.1 F1 score and oftentimes even behind the open models. Another point he makes is that the high dimensionality of the embeddings might actually work against you if you're looking to implement anything, because higher dimensional vectors, if you want to build a search index, for example, they require a much more memory intensive index structure, which will cost you more money. And even disregarding money, uh, searching through a higher dimensional space can be a lot slower than searching through a low dimensional space. And he points out that it's not really an option to compress these high dimensional embeddings. They are using something like PCA 
FDA as that deteriorates their performance quite quickly. Now the claim is just made right here, but I think he must have some experience or references from somewhere. So I guess that would also count for downsampling uh, methods such as random projections, but I don't know. I guess that's still open out there to try. Now it is to be said that when the author here tried to use the OpenAI API to reproduce the numbers in the paper, it resulted in different numbers. Which makes one wonder, uh, did they change the model since the paper? Or maybe is there something wrong with this evaluation? Now curiously, if I read this correctly, actually the numbers of the current API used are better than the numbers that are in the paper, which is weird. But also people have pointed out minor issues that can creep in and really destroy your results, such as Gwern right here pointing out that you cannot have new lines in your embedding queries, otherwise the embeddings become almost unusable, which is a thing that OpenAI discusses in their API documentation. However, Reimers responded to this and said that yes, indeed, he had replaced the new lines. He'd actually used the exact code that he found in an OpenAI website snippet. So these results do look pretty legit. In fact, one of the main authors of the paper has put out a response, I guess. I mean, it's not responding to anything. It's just a Twitter thread, but it comes kind of in the light of these criticisms about how they evaluate their embedding models in OpenAI's API. This goes into more detail on the evaluation, uh, mainly reciting points from the paper, but being a little bit more, yeah, we don't always achieve the best results possible uh, than the, the blog post is because the blog post just shows average numbers and says, well, we're state of the art pretty much everywhere. But if you look into detail a little bit more, uh, the picture becomes a bit more murky. I'll link all the threads here in the description. I think one point to be mentioned right here, which is made by the author here and also by the blog post is that, hello, this is Yannick from the future. I've waited on this story a bit because we have some new development. The authors quasi responded again and not really brought anything new to the table, but just put sort of the things being said into context here in that they do point out that on many of the information retrieval, so the, the search tasks, uh, the embeddings are actually performing really well. And that on, on zero shot, keep that in mind, including, for example, the Phi QA data set where they outperform something like BM25 or other models by a wide margin. On top of that, they also put the cost in perspective, saying that for this example data set, and this is a fairly, let's say, average data set, the cost of embedding the documents and the queries is $80. So the blog post always compared costs of embedding X many millions of tokens. But if you go to actual data set, yes, the embeddings are still going to be more expensive, but the absolute cost might actually not be as much as the blog post might seem. Of course, that depends entirely on how large your data set is. But spending 80 bucks for a 62% relative improvement seems to be a nice deal. So it seems to really depend on the data set at hand, and you might have to try it out on a subset of your data. This was then greeted by a response response uh, saying that Yes, but the much smaller model and much cheaper model is just 0.1 of a score better than the largest GPT-3 model. Also, Niels asked why the evaluation was just done on 11 out of the 18 data sets. We don't have a response yet to that, but it's been a week, so I don't expect we'll get one. And that is where it stands currently back to Yannick in the past. In their experience, uh, these embeddings seem to do quite well when you have to transfer them to a new domain. A lot of these openly available models, they are trained on specific data sets, you know, with specific benchmarks in mind and all of that. So they kind of come from the academic world for the academic world and therefore might overperform even on a different data set. It is still a clean data set that has been assembled kind of to be a benchmark and so on. While what OpenAI is saying that if we take these embeddings and actually go to the real world, our customers see big improvements in their own applications. Now, of course, there's no way to verify that. And the blog post lists three examples of customers saying, oh, look, they are able to find like six to 10 times more relevant examples for something, or they pump their performance from 64% to 89%. Again, there's no way to verify that, but I wouldn't actually actually be surprised if that is the case. Real world data is a lot more messy than any of the academic data sets. And therefore, I guess only trying it out will actually tell you whether it's useful or not.
I do have to wonder about the price though. Like there are two possibilities essentially. One, OpenAI has done market research and so on. And this is what they think people will pay for this. Like this is how much value they think they bring with their API. Or on the other hand, this is kind of their operating cost plus some margin to make the shareholders happy. Now, I really can't tell. Apparently, they do have customers, so someone must be willing to pay all of this. On the other hand, it does seem outrageously expensive for such a small improvement, at least in these academic data sets. So let me know what you think. Is this even profitable for OpenAI? Like, does anyone have any estimates on what it costs them to develop these new models and to keep them? running. It must be massive endeavor. In any case, that was it for the special episode of ML News. Merch is still available. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.